Ahí está. Excelente. Sí. Entonces vamos, vamos a comenzar. Bienvenidos a todos. Ah, a tenemos presentar. que admitir. Sí. Entonces, Alex, si ustedes pueden... Yeah. Alex, feel free to, to start your own. That's so... Good afternoon to everyone. Thank you for being here this afternoon with us. Um, welcome to today's American Society of Environmental History event, the last of three sessions on geography, geographers, and historians, territory and nature in Latin America. The objective of these sessions is to share with the academic public our reflections on the theories epistemologies, concepts, and methods with which we approach environmental history in Latin America. Special thanks are due to Marina Miralla and Sandro Dutra for their careful work organizing these sessions. Today's session includes four speakers. Our first speaker, Claudia Real, will give a talk on territorial state building in Colombia with emphasis on Colombian forests. Our second and third speakers, Marina Miralla and Cairo da Silva Santos, will discuss the historical geography of the Guarani Jesuit missions of Argentina. And our third speaker, fourth speaker, sorry, Sandro Dutre Silva, will present the historical and geographical reports on agricultural colonization in central Brazil. Our first speaker, Claudia Leal, is an associate professor at the Department of History and Geography at the Universidad de los Andes in Bogota and holds a PhD in Geography from the University of California at Berkeley. She is author of Landscapes of Freedom, Building a Post-Emancipation Society in the Rainforest of Western Columbia from the University of Arizona Press and co-editor of A Living Past, Environmental Histories of Modern Latin America, along with John Saluri and José Augusto Padua, both of which have also been published in Spanish. She's writing a history of Colombian national parks as a form of territorial state building. Claudia, the floor is yours. Um, thank you, Alex, and thank you everybody for being here. Uh, I think the biggest thank you should go to Marina and Sandro for organizing these sessions and giving us the opportunity of being together and share our work. Uh, so thank you, thank you very much. Um, let me share my screen. Let's see. Okay, give me a minute. All right, so today I'm gonna to be talking about a little offshoot of my project of national parks in Colombia. I'm gonna be talking more widely about different strategies of territorial state building in my country, which is a country covered by forests. And I am going to start with a little story that happened in this region called the Caguan in 1984 during the peace process of President Belisario Betancourt. At that time, uh, representatives of 39 community action councils, which are groups uh, in which peasants are organized, met with a group of FARC commanders and representatives of different state institutions to discuss the problems of the region. The peasants in that opportunity decided that they were going to form a committee to try to control the settlement process that had been happening in this region for the last two decades. And they were part, you know, an active part. They were the result precisely of that settlement process. And the control of the process meant uh, instituting a series of measures to conserve part of, um, you know, the biodiversity, the nature of the region. For example, the area, the vegetation along, um, rivers and other uh, water courses and the places where animals tend to go and eat uh, minerals uh, from the soils of the jungle. But really the main concerns of peasants was how to guarantee that they could actually get titles for their lands. And the reason why that was a big concern is because they faced a very big obstacle. That obstacle was this enormous forest reserve, that was the Amazonian forest reserve, one of seven instituted 
in 1959. Sorry? Okay, so the Amazonian Forest Reserve was one of seven forest reserves that had been created in 1959 with the idea that those forests had to be conserved for the extraction of the resources and not for the creation of farms uh, and individual titling as peasants uh, in the area were expecting. So what I wanna do in this talk is explore the tensions of different forms of territorial state building as we can see in the problem that the peasants were having in the 1980s in the Caguan region. I am going to be talking about four different kinds of territorial state units. And ultimately what I'm gonna be doing is using a perspective, um, a geographical perspective, an environmental history perspective to place forests at the center of state building in Colombia. Something that should be useful for many other Latin American countries since Colombia is not the only country that has an extensive forest cover as we can see in this map. But I think more broadly, what I'm trying to get at is how to place nature at the center of state building more broadly, not only in Colombia and Latin America, but really anywhere. So let me start with a section that I'm going to call the agrarian ideal. In, 19, in 1821, with the very first constitution of what was then um, the Republic of Colombia, the territory was divided into administrative units. Those units at the time were, the biggest ones were provinces, those provinces were divided into, um, sorry, the biggest one were departments. Those departments were divided into provinces. Provinces were divided into cantones and cantones were divided into parroquias. A lot has changed, but today we still have basic territorial units that I say are universal in the sense that they cover the entire territory of the Republic of Colombia. What we have today are departments, as we can see in this map, and departments are divided into municipalities. Any little chunk of land, if Colombia is part of a municipality and is part of a department. These units were organized around urban settlements, cities and towns, and they had their designated authorities. But there are two things that I would like to highlight about these different kinds of units in which my country has been divided in it, the, it, two centuries of existence. One is that these um, units were coupled with another ideal. Um, and let me back track a little bit. I would say that these units, and here I'm borrowing the words of uh, Nancy Peluso and Peter van der Geest, were utopian fictions, were ideals that the state was striving to achieve. But these ideals were coupled with, and this is one of the other points that I was trying to make, with the ideal of private property. Private property in the form mainly of farms and haciendas was seen as fundamental for the building of these municipalities and these departments. And those farms and haciendas were part of another ideal, which is a landscape ideal, which I would call an agrarian landscape ideal, dominated by domestic species. Those domestic species could be native corn, foreign wheat, or old world cows, pigs, donkeys, and uh, horses. So that landscape ideal was very different from the way that another landscape was conceived, which is the forested landscape that we can see in this image here. You could see this, you know, dreadful view of the landscape of the forests. And those forests could be transformed into agrarian landscapes through the establishment of these domestic species and in fact, the process of frontier expansion that produced that change um, was um, anchored in laws at the end of the, of the 19th century that made those particular landscapes, the non-existence of forests and the existence of these cultivated plants, the basis for 
acquiring land titles, that is the private property that was at the basis of this agrarian idea. Now that, as you can see, clashes with what these forest reserves meant. Forest reserves, as I mentioned before, were created with a very different idea, with the idea that forests should remain in place and that they should remain in place for the extraction of the resources. That is because of their economic potential. Although forest reserves were created, as I mentioned before, in over 60% of the national territory in 1959, the logic, the rationale for, created them, for creating them was older. It went back to two different processes. The first one is the development of extractive economies in the forests, the most important of which was um, rubber extraction in the 19th and early 20th centuries, which allowed the state to see in the forest a very important source of revenue. But the other, the other source of revaluing forests was their importance for conserving water. And what made water so important were again, two different processes now of the 20th century. The first one that I illustrate with this picture of uh, Medellin in 1910 was urbanization. You know, urbanization in Colombia was slower than in other parts of the region. And the city of Medellin, for instance, created a reserve in its uh, surroundings to guarantee the provision of water in, um, in the decade of 1910. The second uh, important source for valuing forests as um, in the role for conserving water was the establishment of large scale commercial agriculture as is illustrated by this picture. Uh, Claudia, your microphone is off. Sí, me acabo de dar cuenta y no sé qué fue lo que pasó, pero did you miss something? About no. 10 seconds. Okay, then nothing, nothing very important. So I was saying that the second picture is a picture of the extensive, really at the beginnings of the extensive cultivation of sugarcane in the Cauca Valley in Colombia that led to the creation of some small forest reserves in uh, the region to guarantee the provision of water, both for towns around there, but very importantly for sugarcane. So these came before the massive creation of forest reserves in 1959 with um, law two of that, um, of that year that put 61% of the country under uh, reserve status. This led to a very strong tension between those two landscapes ideal, the ideal of the forested landscape for the extraction of resources and the ideal of the agrarian landscape for the progress of the nation into very different terms. That tension was exacerbated uh, for another reason and is that Forest reserves were to be managed from Bogota, that is from the Ministry of Agriculture, while municipalities and departments had regional and local authorities. So what you have here is a tension between landscape ideals that were part of two different kind of territorial units on the one hand, and on the other hand, a tension between the central state and the regional and the local state. This tension was even stronger with the creation of national parks that started timidly in the 1960s, as this map shows. This um, areas in red are the parks created in the 1960s, and the areas in red here are the maps, uh, the parks, sorry, created in the 1970s. So while we have the first form of territorial state formation that started back in 1851 with the beginning of the Republic. We have the creation of reserves, you know, timidly in the beginning of the 20th century, but in a more definitive way in 1959, and really the establishment of a system of national parks in the 1970s. Uh, parks were created for very different reasons, for the conservation of water, for the conservation of wonderful landscapes, but no matter the reason, most of the parks in Colombia actually conserve large areas of um, forests. Uh, 
So the clash between the different forms of conceiving the national territory continued, and I'm going to um, give two examples. One from these three parks that you can see here, there's Macarena, Tinigua, and Picachos in green. And in red, you have the limits of municipalities. These municipalities came for the most part after the establishment of the very first park. And they came into being by the process of frontier expansion that is related with chopping down the forests that were the reason why these parks were created in the first place. So you have a very strong tension in place between those two different ways of understanding or of building landscapes. I'm moving now closer to where I am now. What you can see here in yellow in the shape of a butterfly is Chingasa National Park. What you can see here in this brownish color is Bogota, where I am located right now. And what you can see in blue here is the infrastructure that connects the park with the city and takes the water collected in the park to the people in the city, like um, me, as we can see here. But if we look at this other map that has, you know, the park in the form of the butterfly, we can see in blue the municipal limits. So if we focus on the municipality of Fomeke, what we see here is that half of the territory of Fomeke here is part of the park. So the creation of Chingasa National Park in 1977, what it did was effectively snatch away from Fomeke the control of half of its municipal area. Now, I am getting close to the end of this talk. What we can see so far from municipalities and departments on the one hand and forest reserves and national parks on the other hand is really a very di dichotomic view of the national territory. One, two different types of areas reserved for nature and forests and another kind of area where people could live, but really no overlap. Some areas for people, some areas for nature and forests, but people really were not supposed to live in forests. But as we know, people have been living in forests ever since there has been people in these territories. That led to the last um, type of territorial state unit that I'm gonna be talking about, which are ethnic territories. Ethnic territories in Colombia are a product of agrarian reform and the struggle of peasants in the 1970s for their lands. Indigenous groups from the Andean core of the country joined peasants to um, defend the resguardos that they had since colonial times. People in jungle areas, in tropical rainforests in the Amazon did not have colonial resguardos, but in the 1980s, the struggle of indigenous peoples moved from the Andean core to the jungles and led to the creation of huge resguardos, as we can see in this map here. All these ones in this particular color were created in the 1980s. Similarly, in the other region, that's uh, the second most important forested region in Colombia, which is the Pacific coast, as you can see here, resguardos were also created. And the logic behind the creation of resguardos in the jungle was that indigenous peoples were stewards of nature, were guardians of the forest. And so there was also this idea of conservation. But the Pacific coast is mostly inhabited by black people. And so that led to the creation of another kind of territory, which are the communal territories of black people because black people are considered an ethnic group since, 19, since the 1991 constitution in Colombia. So what you have is this forested areas, both Amazonia and the Pacific coast of Colombia, dominated by this ethnic territories that are resguardos on the one hand and territories of black communities on the other hand. So four different kinds of territorial state units municipalities, departments, forest reserves, national parks, resguardos, collective territories of black communities, all of which constitute part of that integrate, intricate constellation of institutions and relations 
that we refer to with that generic and often obfuscating term, which is the state. Through these units, a homogeneous national territory as seen in a map is invested with specificities that facilitate territorial management. Although reality never matches the ideal envisioned through these spatial artifacts, these artifacts not only reveal state mentalities and rationalities, but they also have effects in the way different social groups and players interact in the lived space. What I have tried to do in this presentation is show the importance of thinking spatially as geographers do. And not only spatially, but recognizing that it's not only space that matters, but the very concrete material traits of that space. Forests in particular have a potent physicality and an innate richness that has greatly contributed to the cultural significance as places of origin, ruin, or possibilities. And although we have often ignored them, they have been and still are there shaping our worldviews, our future, and the institutions of government that define our nation. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Claudia. Wonderful presentation very visual. Um, we will go now to our second speaker of the, of the day. Um, let me see here. So presents Marina Miralla is an associate professor, coordinator of the area of geographic information technologies and spatial analysis and director of the specialization in thematic cartography applied to spatial analysis at the National University of General Sarmiento in Buenos Aires. She is a professor of the Technical School of Geographic Information Systems at the National University of General Sarmiento, a professor of the master's program in Environment and Sustainable Development of the Virtual University of Quilmes and of the Environmental History Seminar of the bachelor's degree program of geography at the University of Buenos Aires. She is editor of the ALAC, Historia Ambiental Latinoamericana y Caribeña, the scientific journal from Latin America and Caribbean Society for Environmental History, SOLSHA, and is a member of the board of directors of SOLSHA. Cairo da Silva Santos is a geographer, geography teacher at the Municipal Education Network of Araruama, he is a doctoral student at the Graduate Program in Geography at the Federal University of Rio de Janeiro and has a master's degree in geography at the same institution. He is a member and collaborator in the Laboratory of Cartography at the Federal University of Rio de Janeiro and develops works within the areas of historical geography, toponymy, teaching cartography, and historical geography. Marina. Hi everyone, thanks for joining us in this panel. My presentation is about the historical geography of the Guarani Jesuit missions in Argentina, Brazil, and Paraguay. And with the guide da Silva Santos develops this document. The territorial organization of the Guarani Jesuit missions in the present Argentine provinces of Misiones and Corrientes and Paraguay and Brazil produce great urban transformations and a new spatial order from the performance of the Compañía de Jesús in the indoctrination of the Guarani in the form of reductions. The Guaraníes came from the Amazonas and were part of the Tupi Guarani group. The missions were founded in this region in 1609 and lasted 459 years until the Jesuits were expelled in 1768. At the beginning of the 17th century, 30 doctrines were founded about the Salto del Guaira. Between 1609 until 1641, there were changes of the towns attacked by the Mamelucos, Bandeirantes, and indigenous people from the Guaira area 
towards Argentine Mesopotamia and Paraguay and Brazil. Since the foundation of the first reductions until today, different cities, towns, and villages have emerged in the area. This origin was due to different reasons, such as the displacement of previous occupations, the founding of immigrant colonies, or even the occupation of the territory. There is something peculiar about this occupation through careful observation of historical maps. The majority of cities which had their origin in the old Jesuit reductions have kept their names since then. The others founded later had changes in their names or even had different characteristics. The consolidation process of an urban structure promoted by the Compañía de Jesús allowed the identification of urbanization as a system of control of the aborigines. That portion of the Argentine territory, until the arrival of the Jesuits, was occupied by the Guaraníes, a society dedicated themselves to agriculture, hunting, fishing, and gathering. The mission of the Guaraní Jesuit missions was the scene of many transformation throughout history. Travelers, explorers, and historians gave an account of these changes led by the Spanish and Portuguese to subjugate the original peoples and build a fixed occupation in their own way. Oh, oh. Mm. The location guidelines were set by the Spanish authorities, in this case, the governor of Paraguay, Hernando Arias de Saavedra, or Hernán Arias. The location took into account three aspects, the defense, the evangelization, and the extraction of gold and silver, the latter in the case of the Guarani was not such. Respecting the leches of the Indias, it was thought that the towns were in high areas, with good soils, climate, well drained by water courses. So they were located between the Paraguay, Paraná, and Uruguay rivers, and over the 96 meters above sea level, like San Francisco de Borja. In this presentation, territorial transformations will be analyzed from the perspective of historical geography through historical cartography and Japanese. The sources of information came from chronicles and annals, description of travelers, religious, and historical cartography. The main collections were found in Argentina and Brazil, and the online repositories specialized in documents and historical cartography. The processed materials were obtained mainly from the historical topographic cartography of the National Geographic Institute of Argentina, whose service correspond to the years 1906, 1908, 1909, and 1910, with partial updating in 1939. In turn, the historical maps used in the vectorization process were collected from the digital collection of the University of Sao Paulo and Geocard of the Federal University of Rio de Janeiro, the National Library of Spain, the National Library of Rio de Janeiro, the Library of the Catholic University of Córdoba in Argentina, and the National Library of Argentina in Buenos Aires. Finally, the bibliographic reconstruction of the place names was carried out from the content analyzed of the various historical documents, like this. In the last decades, GIPS or Geographic Information Technologies had a great development within, this, within the sciences in general, and even more so in the social and human sciences, such as geography, history, anthropology, economics, etc. It's common to find in geography a large number of studies carried out with GIPS, but recently it's within historical geography where the applications of GITS begins through the incorporation and processing of historical sources. Thus, the treatment of geographical information 
with CITS has become a practical objective in order to make the management of geographical databases, spatial data, and their attributes more versatile. In this project, some of the guidelines developed by the research groups of the GeoCard of the Federal University of Rio de Janeiro and Historical Cartography Group of the Federal University of Minas Gerais, both in Brazil, were adapted for the work with historical cartography and toponymy. Activities were carried out to select and prepare the cartographic materials, the tabulation of the acquired data, the georeferencing, the cartographic reprojection, and the general aspect of the vectorization. The vectorization work involved the construction of a work methodology that had a large number of, of adjustments to the proposal of creation the files by the rules of the spatial data infrastructure of the Argentine Republic, named IDERA. Toponymy provided the documentary methodological tool that translated the reconstruction of the territory and land uses as well as the environment. The territory construction is an historical process that can be represented graphically through cartographic production that includes maps, plans, sketches, topographic charts, etc. Maps are documents used by society to produce representation of the Earth's surface that, with the passage of times, are transformed into historical archives, keeping representation of their time and spaces. It's within this context that the maps are constituted into important spatio-temporal files, which allow to reanalyze different aspects of the location, distribution, and other characteristics of the geographical phenomena of the past in a current area. The development of historical cartography in our latitudes incorporated from the beginning the technical scientific advances of Europe in order to achieve a greater knowledge of the availability of the natural resources offered by the new territories. It's important to emphasize that cartographic materials are the first documents in which the image of the American territories was imprinted as object of the strategic desire of the European empires. In the course of the centuries of colonization of the Americas, the maps assume important functions, such as the identification of the towns, the mineral and food resources, the built roads, among others. Little by little, the set of maps made from 1492 to the present allowed the visualization of the transformation processes of this area. The toponymy provides a documentary methodological tool that translated the historic dimension of the territory, land use and environment. In particular, in the case of Guarani Jesuit missions, place names allow the reconstruction of cultural relation in that historical society. Through the extraction of geographical names from historical maps and the construction of the context of the nomenclature of this space, a methodology was built to account for how names as symbolical spatial forms articulate meanings and cultural aspects of some social groups. Toponymy, a strong element that creates and transmits messages through their names and meaning, in addition to the name, the act of naming is also symbolic and naming policies are employed by different social groups. In this research, we use different historical maps from the 60s until the middle 19s to investigate the mention toponymic dynamics. The methodology, the methodology is developed from the georeferencing historical maps and extraction of current toponymy. For the extraction of toponymy, we apply the analysis of linguistic content, the works of Dick, Fashion, Misturini, and Paulo Meneses were consulted on the toponymous motivation that allowed us to identify the history of name on ancient maps.
The main results were obtained through the creation and publication of standardized vector coverage and the historical maps viewers. We produced 74 vectorial covers containing human settlements, island, administrative boundaries, water courses, water bodies, railroads adjusted to the standardization of IDERA. On the old map, the coverage was the 24 vectorized files and for the IGN charts to coverage of 46 vectorized files, which are available for consultation and download in the Conurbano IDE. With this coverage and on the basis of the mosaics of IGN charts and old maps, two map viewers were made one, this one, with information from these historical maps, and the other one, and the other one, with the cartographic information from IGN. So, in the middle of 17th century, an important transformation took place in the disparate Guarani society, resulting in a new physiognomy that was translated into the urban economy and social organization. Between 1690 and 1732, the Guarani population increased considerably. Chapechu had lands east of the Uruguay River, where they raised sheep and cattle. Beginning in January 1750, with the signing of the Treaty of Madrid, where border disputes were resolved between the kingdoms of Spain and Portugal, Spain delivered seven missionary towns from the province of Paraguay to Portugal. In this process of change from Spain to Portugal, the names also changed from Spanish to Portuguese. Between 1860 and, uh, 60 and 17, during the Portuguese occupation of the Eastern Bank, the doctrines of the right bank of Uruguay were destroyed. The supreme dictator of the Republic of Paraguay destroyed the five doctrines in the south of Paraná. At the methodological level, we were able to integrate the data and transform it into standardized geographic information according to IDERA and IGN. The investigation of geographical names make it possible to understand a part of the processes of change in the landscape of different places. Together with other, other documents, it's an important step for research on past environments. These experiences have helped us to start our line of research in the application of historical cartography and toponymy in the analysis of territorial transformation. Thanks, everyone. Gracias, Marina. Thank you very much for your talk. Now we will go to our third presentation of the day with Sandro Dutre Silva. He is an environmental historian of the Brazilian Cerrado Biome. He earned his bachelor's from the Goiás State University, master's from the Federal University of Goiás, and a PhD from the University of Brasilia. He is currently full professor of environmental history at the Evangelical University of Goiás and professor of history at the State University of Goiás. He is the author of No Oeste a Terra e o Céu, A Expansão da Fronteira Agrícola no Brasil Central, In the West, Land and Sky, The Expansion of the Agricultural Frontier in Central Brazil, and editor of the, the book collection História Ambiental, Volumes 1, 2, and 3. He is editor-in-chief of the ALAC, the Historia Ambiental Latinoamericana y Caribeña, the scientific journal from Latin American and Caribbean Society for Environmental History, SOLCHA. He is also deputy editor of Ambiente and Sociedade, a scientific journal from the Brazilian Society for Environmental Science Graduate Studies. Dutri Silva is a member of the board of directors of SOLCHA 2018-2020, he is a member of the American Society for Environmental History 
and of the Brazilian Histori History Association, UMPU. He is a full member of the Historical and Geographic Institute of Goiás, Chair 49. He is a fellow of the National Council for Scientific and Technological Development as a Research Productivity Scholarship. Sandro, you may now begin. Thank you. Sandro. Okay. Uh, thank you, Alex. Let me share it here. Okay. Um, hi, greetings to everyone. Thank you for attending this, this panel uh, related to Latin America. And my, my compliments and my gratitude to SEH uh, for organizing Environmental History Week and make possible for us to be together in times of pandemic. When I was preparing to apply for a PhD position at the University of Brasilia, which was my institution of choice, I had an appointment with, with the professor from the Department of History for an interview about my research project. During our interview, he said that he was going to be straightforward with me because he did not recognize an intellectual promise in my project on colonization, migration in Goiás. According to him, what happened in the peripheral Goiás was completely irrelevant for social history. His point of view, if I really wanted to enter at that university, I would need to change my subject to something that was applicable and historiographically good enough. Despite being uh, a little disappointed, I answered his unexpected comment saying that I was determined to. I explained to him that this subject goes beyond the regional perspective because it was associated with the national colonization policy of the march to the West. In addition, this was of great importance to me and I was resolute to search out answers for the questions that is still heavily lingered in my mind. Even if I were rejected by the Department of History of the University of Brasilia, I would choose another institution. I ended up developing my dissertation at the University of Brasilia with another professor, my esteemed and now retired professor Vanessa Basil. Nevertheless, what I really did not imagine at the time and that could have been helpful to my dissertation was that Goiás in the Brazilian heartland attract the curiosity of distinguished foreign geographers, which could add my research into a broader fascinating topic of Latin America geographical studies. Some years later in Portugal, while taking part of the 2014 World Conference for Environmental History, I was greatly impacted by a photograph that was shared by the geographer Stephen Bell from UCLA. It was a photograph taken in 1952 by another UCLA geographer, Henry Bruman, on a visit to the Brazilian state of Goiás, where he recorded firsthand the deforestation that was taking place. This was a pivotal moment for me. And from the subsequent research opportunities I had in the United States, it became even more obvious the necessity to investigate geographical reports produced from, from the collaboration between American universities and Brazilian institutions. Those archival documents proved to be important to the environmental history of the agricultural frontier expansion in Central Brazil. So my presentation today refers to a project is still in progress, a book project. And due to the limitation of time, I will briefly introduce some reports produced by the geographers, Leo Weibel, Henry Bruman, Robert Platt, and Preston James in Central Brazil. And I conclude by exploring future research possibilities using these documents. Leo Vivo is undoubtedly the best known foreign geographer in Brazil for, to for the topic of agrarian colonization. He was a professor at the University of Bonn and migrated to the United States fleeing Nazi persecution. In the US, Vivo worked on migration projects in Washington DC and also as a professor at the University of Wisconsin Madison. Starting in 1946, he, con he conducted the first systematic study of on colonization in central Brazil. 
In his field research in Goiás, Weibel applied new approach to geographical studies with a detailed methodology for organizing notes, field diaries, photographs, and sketches. About his interest in starting his studies from, from Goiás, Weibel made the following explanation, quote, many times I have been asked why I started my field work in the distant and wild state of Goiás. The answer is simple. As I was interested in the process of colonization, I had to go into the interior. Furthermore, since I was also interested in knowing the original vegetation and understanding its transformation by human activity, I decided to go to a region where human influence was minimal. What drew Weibel's attention was the fact that the region was experiencing a significant agricultural expansion. His analysis saw the traditional use of the concept of pioneering settlement, widely used by Latin American geographical studies. Quote, in agricultural issues, neither the extractive nor the hunter nor the cattle raiser can be considered as pioneers. Only the farmer can be called as such, being able to be a pioneer from Tuesday. He alone is able to transform the natural forested landscape into a cultural one and to feed a large number of people in the small areas." End quote. A curious note in the Bible studies was that he made predictions, even in the 1940s, that the Cerrado would soon become the country's great breadbasket. Bible compared a common assessment about the low fertility of the Cerrado with the erroneous belief that German farmers had about forests in, the medieval, in, in medieval times. In his words, quote, I'm personally convinced that in a not very distant future, the best soil types of the Brazilian savanna will be cultivated in a similar way to the former woodlands in Central Europe. Another great geographer of note was Henry Bruman. Bruman was part of the first generation of geographers at the Berkeley School, who was strongly influenced by Carl Sauer's cultural geography in Latin American studies. As a professor at the University of California, Los Angeles, he took part in the field research in South America between 1951 to 1952. His ambitious research trip to South America in the 1950s was funded by the Office of Naval Research, ONR, an institution in which Carl Sauer served as the main manager. In his report, Brumer maintained the geographic tradition of thinking the, the frontier in Latin America from the perspective of pioneering settlement. In his words, quote, the theme of pioneer settlement is a basic one in cultural geography. And it is one with which most South American countries are at present vitally concerned. The countries have an understandable desire to bring primitive or underpopulated area, areas into the effective national territory by means of agricultural colonization, and a considerable number of them have active settlement programs in progress. Bruman sought to justify that agricultural colonization was a recurrent theme in governmental programs for settlement expansion in several South American countries at that time, namely Colombia, Bolivia, Peru, Argentina, and Paraguay. However, governments deferred on essential environmental social and economic issues of pioneering settlements, such as type of soil, climate, and the extent of which colonizers should be national or foreign. Rumors documents about Goiás are composed by previous readings, notebooks, photographs, reports, and a rich archival collection. His reports consist of unpublished material that reflects his geographical perspective of central Brazilian frontier. His notes on colonization in Goiás, especially regarding foreign settlements, demonstrate his concern with distant, distance and geographic isolation, as well as with the edific and climatic conditions of the region. When he visited the National Agriculture Colony, uh, he highlighted the previous, his previous speculations about the challenging conditions for pioneering settlement. In his words, quote, it seems to be universally agreed by those conversant with this subject that a, a strict 
subsistent colonization without the possibility of cash sales of crops, even in the presence of otherwise favorable conditions of soil and climate, is no longer feasible in the modern world. It leads at best to stagnation and usually to failure. Unlike the most views on the frontier expansion in, in Midwestern Brazil, which sought to exalt the region as a privileged site for pioneer settlement, Bruma demonstrates the countless difficulties settlers had to face in environmental and socioeconomic terms. In 2016, I had the opportunity to visit the archives of Robert Platt at the University of Chicago. He was part of the select group of geographers interested in Latin American studies. The archival documents found in Platt's special collection reinforce that he played an important role in Brazilian geography. Evidence of his leading role can be, uh, can be seen in a set of letters exchanged with Brazilian and American geographers. For example, uh, in a letter from 1930, Platt wrote to Preston James, offering information about his upcoming visit to Brazil. In 1935, Platt made another trip to Brazil, visiting the Amazon and leaving a beautiful and important uh, photographic collection. For example, in a fascinating photograph, Platt recorded the dramatic process of deforestation in the Amazon. The research related to the central Brazil was produced in collaboration with the Brazilian Institute of Geography, the In a memo from 1947, Platt recorded his impressions about the establishment of the new federal capital in the country. He also highlighted his goals and expertise as a political geographer interested in the studies of national capitals and their locations. Quote, for at least 10 years, I have been interested in the purpose of choosing the new capital of Brazil, considering this to be an unusual and quite significant project. He also recorded his, prelimina uh, his preliminary observations highlighting a considerable advantage of the state of Goiás to reinforce, the, to receive, sorry, the new federal capital. As a favorable point, he mentioned that the highlands of central Brazil had a most healthful and invigorating climate. Platt also pointed out the highlands of Goiás were endowed with, the, with a rich and beautiful landscape, in addition to having abundant natural resources. Uh, the American geographer uh, emphasized the, uh, that Goiás had also the most progressive and promising community in the frontier region of Brazil, highlighting the infrastructure already built and the promising opportunities for development. In his words, Goiás is near to the geometrical center of Brazil than any other potential site for federal district. And is on the most direct project international air route to North America, end quote. In addition to geographic and socioeconomic potentialities, Platt reinforced the greatest appeal to the Brazilian territory imagination, highlighting the march to the West policy. In his words, quote, if the dreams could now be realized, they would feel inspired to forget all the difficulties and cooperate in the new national efforts direct toward the opening of a productive and uh, attractive region, including areas for tourism. In his notes on the national agriculture colony, Platt sought to remain associated with the tradition of analyzing the frontier issues in Latin America from the perspective of pioneer settlement. The potential sites in Goiás are the moving of the frontier fringe on the boundary in between the occupied agricultural regions of Brazil and the unoccupied or sparsely occupied zones of cattle ranching, cluster mining, uh, forest gathering, and Indian subsistent living beyond the reach of modern land transportation." End quote. In her book titled Beyond the Great Forest, published in the U.S. in 1953, Virginia Pruitt, a journalist from Chicago Sun, and at that time a pioneer in Goiás, mentioned that in 1948, she accompanied Mr. and Mrs. Platt on their, on their trip to the National Agriculture Colony. Pruitt wrote that Roger Ward, an American pioneer and adventurer in Goiás, was with them on that trip. Thus, one important piece of evidence from this trip 
It's a photograph, this is one, uh, published by Platt in 1955. Platt mentioned that the photo was taken in a foreign pioneer farmland, which is supposed to be on Puyot or in Ward's land. Another important source of geographical research in central Brazil was produced by Preston James. James had a career linked to Latin America studies, acting prominently as a professor and researching a researcher at the University of Michigan from 1934 and Syracuse University from 1945. He also served as a consultant, uh, consultant and director of various organizations concerned with Latin America geography and social development. In 1951, James became the president of the Association of American Geographers and in 1957, the president of the Council on Latin American Affairs. Compared to Carl Sauer or James Parsons, Preston James' work did not have the same repercussion in Latin America in terms of influence and scientific production. According to Pedro Quijo Torres, our Mexican colleague in this panel, uh, Preston James was one of the first to carry out the synthesis study entitled Latin America. Preston James' work in Central Brazil brings a fascinating and a particular theme of deforestation of the tropical forest, extending and proceeding more in Dean classical work. James pointed out that the deforestation of tropical forests for agriculture were preferable in Brazil, mainly because of the supposed soil fertility. As soon as the soil became exhausted, the colonizers sought for new woodlands, moving further and further into the interior. In his words, quote, the greater part of the agriculture effort of Brazil has been applied to a relatively small part of the vast country, the tropical forest. James described three major forest lands in Brazil in the 1950s, which were considered as the El Dorado for agriculture frontier expansion. The first was in the south, highlighting Northwestern Paraná as the most successful pioneer area at that time, with fertile soils suitable for coffee and annual crops. The second was the Atlantic Forest in Northern Espírito Santo, Northwestern Minas Gerais, and southward along the coast of Bahia. The main crops of this frontier were coffee, cotton, and rice. The third frontier appointed by, by James was the forested areas in central Brazil. Describe it as a land of tropical forests amid the Cerrado in southern Goiás. James related that in 1940s and 1950s, this area received more publicity than all the other forested frontiers. His explanation for this were that the widely heralded March US policy. But I suppose that the books from John Lowell and Virginia Pruitt, published in the US in the early 1950s, exalting the experiences, experiences as pioneering in Goiás also played an important role. James reported that the use of land in Goiás was developed in the traditional pattern of clearing forests for crops. And from his visit to the National Agriculture Colony, he wrote, quote, there is also an important federal colony in this area, the Colonia Agricola, in which three 1,500 landless farmers have been settled since 1945. To the west of the federal colony, the state colonies for small farmers are now being rapidly developed. Along the east side of the Rio das Almas, there are properties purchased by a number of persons from the United States who seem to see in this remote spot a refuge from the destruction that threatens the rest of the world. The crops in this area include rice, cotton, coffee, maize, and beans." End quote. The great relevance of Preston James' works resides in the connections made between the uh, immigration process, colonization, and deforestation. Another relevant factor is that he makes uses or use of the Brazilian tropical forest as the basis of his history, separating them from the Amazon rainforest. These brief samples of geographic production introduced in central Brazil by foreign geographer, geographers reinforce the historiographical importance 
of migration and agrarian colonization for environmental history. And the reports and other archival documents resulting from this investigation are also a privileged source for the environmental history of Central Brazil, particularly for the Cerrado Biome studies. Other distinguished geographers have left important records which still need to be studied. For example, I would like to highlight the research in the archival documents produced by the geographers Robert Carmen from Ball State University and Robert Pendleton from John Hopkins University. Carmen's documents regarding his visit at the boom town of Annapolis in the 1940s are fundamental to understanding the connections between Brazil's urban southwest and its rural central western hinterlands. Robert Pendleton is another fundamental figure because he was a key person for soil studies and his archives could provide important observation about the Cerrado in the United Forest. In general, geographic studies are privileged sources for environmental history of the Cerrado, mainly because the data in the archival documents help us to understand the historic occupation of this unique biome. These studies also precede the great green revolution in the Cerrado produced from the Brazilian uh, Agriculture Research Corporation in BAPA in the 1970s, a topic that has been a considerable object of research across the academy. Finally, as our colleague Samuel Brandt from UCLA uh, said very well in uh, Monday in this panel, Brazil matters to uh, geography. I would say Brazil matters to Latin American environmental history as well. Thank you very much. very much, Sandro. Um, I think now we can begin our Q&A session for our three presenters here today. Um, I can organize session of questions, maybe two or three different people, and whoever wants to start may either raise their hand using Zoom or turn on their video and wave at me or say something if you wish. And, and Gabriela, I, I just make a small announcement while people organize their questions. Gabriela uh, asked that if we were going to uh, make available the these talks from these the three sessions and if Correct me if I'm mistaken, Sandro, we're gonna upload them to the Alak Solsha YouTube channel, right? Yes, that's correct, that's correct. We have, okay, we have so to edit and then maybe next week, uh, probably, Alex. Uh, we can start with Matias Gonzalez Maridikan, uh, has a question for Claudia. Um, yes, hello. Th uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, hello, Claudia. Thank you very much for your presentation and for everyone here as well. Um, my question is the following. Um, you talk about uh, how, how Colombian state making excluded in some way um, communities. I mean, I mean there, there was a tension, as you said, between reserves, forest reserves, and also uh, the municipalities, no, the, the, this other civic administrative unit. And my question is, if you have found evidence of um, interaction between state management and community management, because nowadays uh, uh, exists, nowadays there's been pro, uh, progression in more community-based agroforestry management, um, like considering local knowledge, considering indigenous knowledge in managing forests. So um, I don't know if you have found evidence of these possibilities of interaction between the state, you no, know, the state and, and community, because uh, as you show us, uh, it's like very much the, the classic history of forest history in the western side of the world, where where the western state is an exclusive, um, exclude, no, it's, it's exclude people. But I don't know if you have found evidence on the other way, from the other way, perspective. 
Um, so, sorry, one last thing. Um, I think, I don't know if you have uh, considered this as well. I see, um, you said that this, there is a tension between nature reserve and civic administrative unit, but to me, it's interesting the case because it can show maybe a possibility of, um, of coexistence of nature and humans. I mean, I'm trying to connect your topic with, with, with what is going on currently you now, like with this idea of coexistence of humans with nature. So um, I don't know, maybe, maybe um, edu educations in, in schools in these places, maybe this was an opportunity to, to encourage identity with nature in these civic, um, in these uh, cities, no? In, 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 you mentioned um, a place called, oh, I, I, I lost the, the, the word, but I don't know, maybe it's a, it was an maybe it's, it's a, it was an opportunity to improve identity, local identity with nature. I don't know if I'm just speculating, maybe it can be an interesting thing to look at. Thanks. Alex, should I respond? Uh, yes, I think while other people are maybe gathering their ideas for the Q and A, you can start answering. Okay, so so thank you, Matthias. Uh, nice to to see you here today. Um, so I see you have um, you want to stress collaboration, you know, rather than tension. Um, and uh, and yes. Um, that you see both things. And uh, let me give a, cap a couple of examples on both of the issues that you raised. Uh, first, if there are collaborations um, between the state and the community in forest man management, you know, I'd say that collaboration comes with tension. So, you know, these two things are not opposite ends, they come together. Some parks and resguardos overlap in different parts of the countries. And so that gives both state authorities, you know, park authorities and indigenous authorities, a responsibility of dealing with, um, or give, gives them the responsibility of being in charge of management of, of these particular areas. Um, there's even a case in Colombia in which the park was created because the indigenous authorities lobbied for it. So there was first a resguardo, but a park um, brought more protection against mining interests. So the leaders of the resguardo lobbied for the creation of a park. Of course, this was half the community. The other half was against it, but you know, they heard more one half of the community than the other. Again, to show that wherever there's collaboration, tensions also present. So in, in, the, in this particular resguardo, Jaigo Heapaporis and many others, um, you know, initially relations were not that great. You know, initially relations between park authorities and indigenous authorities were not great because they not always agreed. And also because the idea of what an indigenous person was in the forest was very, um, static, you know, uh, as long as they complied with the idea of forest stewards, of one particular kind of forest stewards, it worked, but if they wanted to do something else, then it didn't work. Um, but at uh, beginning of this century, there was a change in the management of national parks towards something that was called Parques con la Gente, Parks with People, and that opened the way for much better collaboration between indigenous and park authorities. And that's still going on. But I think if you look at different parks, you'll find different stories. You'll find stories of interesting, productive collaboration. You'll find stories of collaboration that didn't quite work. So, so and not only in forests, you know, in, in, in other kinds of environments too. And um, in, regarding your second point um, between detention um, regarding the tension between reserves and municipalities, of course, what I laid out was kind of a framework to think about uh, these things. You know, th there's so much more to explore. And uh, I only talked about forest reserves and national parks with our which are conservation areas at the national level. But departments and municipalities have also created conservation areas. So there are also uh, parques municipales, parques departamentales, and something that's called here distritos de manejo integral, which include areas that in theory should not be touched, you know, by humans, but also areas where you can have sustainable development and whatnot. The problem, of course, is that many of these uh, regulations are not thoroughly enforced. 
But there you see that the story is more complicated and mm -hmm. that conservation and municipal authorities are not always against each other, but that one can be the product of the other. Sure. Thank you, Claudia. Did anybody raise their hand? Let me take a look. No. Ah, Pedro. Pedro? No? Go ahead, Pedro. Um, well, hello, everybody. Thank you very much for such a pleasant and interesting presentation from everyone. But I'd like to, can, can I speak Spanish? I can be more comfortable. I don't know if it's, I will, I will speak some not really good Spanish, but my English is a bit rusty. Uh, sure, you can, uh, if you want us ask in Spanish, then I can translate it for everybody else. You, it's going to be super. international Spanish, so I imagine everybody will understand. Ok. Quando uh, escutia sobre la economia donut, que es un concepto muy interesante de esta señora Kate Raworth, eh, ella se decía, hay los optimistas, los pesimistas y los activistas. ¿No? Y, y eso me encantó mucho porque yo pienso, intento encuadrarme en la última, ¿no? en ser un activista de alguna manera. Y cuando veía la presentación de Claudia, se presentaba muy claramente esa cuestión de que el territorio está allá, allá. Y luego hay una serie de visiones que conceptualmente no se encajan y se sobreponen y crean una un mosaico uh, que un poco es la propia fase humana, ¿no? esa cosa un poco, esa alma atormentada que colectivamente no se presenta con una, un mínimo de coherencia. Entonces hay ese mismo animal que llega ahí y que empieza a unos protegen, otros explotan, otros eh, habitan simplemente. Y luego entonces... Eh, y me pareció preciosa la presentación porque tenía gráficos excelentes y ponía eso así de una manera clara y incuestionable. Pero me interesaría un poco, aunque yo sepa que el, el pesquisador, el investigador, muchas veces observa y no tiene el, el papel mismo de prever o de entender cómo será el desarrollo exacto de eso. Una cosa es entender el objeto. Y eso ya es mucho. Pero me interesaría mucho saber de Claudia cómo le parece que esa dinámica entre esos conflictos de conceptos y territorios y divisiones, si eso parece caminar a una dirección cualquiera. O sea, si hay una, una tendencia que ese conflicto se conduzca hacia un lado u otro, hacia la protección, hacia la devastación, hacia la ocupación por ejemplo, la coexistencia o lo que sea. Porque es eso, es intentar ver si tenemos algún remedio para esa esquizofrenia colectiva nuestra que ocupa el territorio de varias maneras a la vez. Y me gustaría saber qué, qué le parece eso, porque exacto, uh, Batías acaba de colocar esa idea de coexistencia humana y de, con la naturaleza y yo creo que ese es el gran tema. Entonces, de alguna manera te atrajo otra vez para la misma cuestión, pero un poco pensando de ese desarrollo de cómo esas dinámicas, la, la, el desarrollo de las dinámicas entre esas, esas divisiones conflictuosas. ¿Cómo se, te parece que eso va a avanzar? Gracias, muchas gracias. Thank you, Pedro. I'm going to briefly translate the synthesis of your question so the non-Spanish speakers could be uh, aware of what we were asking. Uh, in general terms, Pedro asked Claudia to talk a little bit more about territorial conflicts regarding uh, different land uses, historically speaking, many times that are representative of a 
incapacity of humans to rightfully coexist with uh, ecosystems within their frame or mode of land occupation and land use. It's basically what I catched from everything that he said. Is that more or less what he was asking, Kalia, and to, to comment on, on your thoughts regarding the diversity of different types of land uses and the conflicts, the territorial conflicts that occur in the Colombian forest and the frontier of the Colombian forest. I know, I, that's what I, that's what I understood anyway, Claudia. Your microphone is still off. Oh, okay. Um, so which language should, should I respond in? Is English all right? I think in English, I think it's best more and more democratic. Okay. Um, well, um, Pedro, thank you very much for, for your question. You know, I, I think I don't have um, a clear answer. I don't think there's one tendency. And part of the reason why I don't see one clear tendency is because of the scale of, of what I presented. You know, I'm talking about 200 years and the entire country. Uh, so if you look at different places, you're going to see different realities. And I, I like very much the way you started the question, saying that there's some people that are pessimistic, some people who are optimistic, and then who are people who are activists. And I think that what you're saying is that different people can look at the same processes, at the same evidence, and come to different conclusions. So let's take, for example, something that's um, hot at this moment in uh, Colombian uh, politics, which is the relationship between peasants and parks because there are a lot of peasants living in parks and there has been, there was a, um, you know, for several years, um, a group of people from the parks and the, and, and, and the peasant groups, you know, talking and trying to figure out something and, you know, not much really came out of it, you know, some reports and, but really not any solution to a problem that it's a, a very tough problem. And it's a very tough problem from both perspectives. Certain parts, like the park that I love the most because I you know, used to live there, um, is being literally destroyed by cattle ranchers and peasants. And uh, it's this lovely area in the fringes of the Amazon and it's being eaten up by cattle and, uh, and grass. So, you know, you could have a very pessimistic viewpoint from, you know, this traditional conservation standpoint. But on the other hand, uh, the friends that I have from the region, you know, peasants who've been there from before the park was created, you know, could also have either pessimistic or an optimistic viewpoint. Pessimistic in the sense that they're still squatters, you know, they don't have rights, you know, if they create a school, the school is torn down. But they could also have an optimistic viewpoint in the sense that they're there, it's their land, they're being heard. You know, it, the problem has not been solved, but they're in a different political standpoint that they were, you know, 15, 15 years ago. So this is maybe to not respond to your question, to say that your question really is many different questions of how these different units interact with each other that if you look at them in one place or a different or another place, you're going to see different things. And if you look at them or I look at them, we're probably going to have um, different answers. I don't like this response, you know, it's the kind of response where you kind of wash your hands <laughs> and don't say anything. But um, so, but, but that's it, at least for now. Maybe we can talk more about it someday. Thank you. Thank you, Claudia. Um, I'm going to now read a question. Uh, from Ana Brasil to Sandro. Uh, Sandro, could you tell us about the role of photos in the work of the geographers you're considering? Okay, thank you, Ana, for your question. This is a, this is a intricate question because I, I was reading uh, exactly today the book of Robert Platt entitled Latin America. And, uh, and I, I enjoy so much a part where Platt said that uh, his project, uh, it was based on uh, a method of reconnaissance. So in this reconnaissance, the regional complexity of Latin America, it, this book was, was published in 94, it's 1942. And he spent 20 years studying uh, Latin America. And uh, he said that, uh, 
he found uh, the this this uh, this complexity could be found in intricate uh, pattern of which he calls the details that fit together a significant contribution. So I suppose that. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to, 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 to explain why they are using those photographs as, uh, as a, a part of the reconnaissance. All of them, uh, Preston James, Robert Platt, Robert Pendleton, uh, Leo Vivo, for example, he was accompanied by three photographers that were uh, sponsored by the National Council of Geography. Uh, these, these photographers, played an important role in, 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 in this field research. Uh, so we, we won't find the photographs that was taken by Leo Weibel. But all of them uh, in the archives, we'll find a lot of photographs. And so for me, it, 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 it part of that uh, cultural geography and methodology I uh, I really enjoy your presentation yesterday, and uh, when we are we, and, and since that I was trying to 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 found a uh, a pattern or a connection between Cal Sauer cultural geography and the Latin American studies that were developing in the United States universities uh, related to the Latin American studies. What what I can say, uh, because this is a researching project and I have a lot of archives to, 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 search, uh, uh, to research yet, is that uh, there was a group of geographers interested in exchanging uh, methods, exchanging documents, exchanging places you have to go, exchanging, for example, this specific topic related to central Brazil for example, pioneering settlements. And so, in my opinion, the photos, it was a kind of representation of the scene, of the landscape that was transformed by the presence of human uh, in that place. So it, there, in, in this way, I, I understand there is a connection between how our cultural geography and the methods that those geographers use here in Central Brazil. But it's actually a fascinating topic, and uh, it's something that I I I I would like to mention something. For example, most of the, these photographs are belonging to the University of Wisconsin Milwaukee, uh, the American uh, American Geographical Society in Milwaukee. They have a digital archives, and for example, I found photographs of Robert Platt during 1930s, but 1940s, where he was visiting Goiás. Uh, it was not available because, and the, and the digital archive says that they were not in a very good uh, condition. So they, they didn't digitalize it. So I need to go and find this for us. And I visit uh, Robert Platt's uh, special collection in Chicago, University of Chicago. But there was a lot of a huge number of photographs but none of them were uh, having a specific place and, and date. So it was uh, hard working to do. And uh, the same have with the uh, Henry Bruman, for example, and at, at UCLA in the special collection of Bruman, there is a lot of photographs uh, that uh, we need to identify it. And uh, a lot of part of photographs are belonging to Professor Stephen Bell is a private archive. And uh, he, was he was trying to find somebody to help him in identifying those photographs. But it, it was part of this, this wonderful cultural geography to, to interpret the landscapes and the transformation of landscapes. So much more interested, not in the landscape, but the, the role of human transforming that landscape. So I, I suppose that uh, is that reason that uh, photograph was part of their uh, method in, in field trips. Thank you, Sandro. Um, now I'm gonna open the mic for Rogério. He has a question for all three speakers. 
Okay. Uh, first, I, I would like to thank all the panelists. It was fantastic. I learned a lot. Well, uh, for Marina, I asked her about the uh, about toponym. It was fantastic to understand how important is the, the toponym and the, the, the types of toponym. And ask, I asked her for if is there any influence of slaves uh, in the toponym of the region where you study, Marina. Okay, and for Claudia, I'd like to know a little bit about the influence of the guerrilla with the uh, conservation units, okay? And for Sandro, uh, how are, I, I was considering how the maps you showed us, the maps done, I, I, if I'm not wrong, in 1940, how they were done uh, in relation with uh, uh, the, the for, forest and the not forest areas, with, with, with what technique? Okay, this is all my questions. Okay, yes. um, th th thank you, Sandra. Okay, the short answer. Sí. Um, yeah. In the region of Brazil, there is a, a more a importance of slavery to pony. Um, okay, Claudia and then Sandro. Um, so, well, that'd be a, a, a contrary to Marina, would be a long answer. So, I'll, I'll, I'll try to keep it short. Um, forests in particular have been very important allies to guerrilla warfare in Colombia. And um, as you can imagine, guerrillas have hidden, you know, historically in the forest. And you find, you know, ample evidence about that. And that's not only the case of of the guerrillas here, that's the case of, you know, the, the guerrillas in Cuba with the Sierra Maestra, the guerrillas in Mexico. So, you know, that that's kind of a general, a, a general story. And that is related, but I don't think it's the only reason why uh, in the last phase of the FARC guerrillas before the peace accord of 2016, several fronts of the FARC enacted um, environmental measures within their territories. Um, it's important to realize that these measures were not taken by the Secretariat, that is by the, by the top commanders of the guerrilla, but, but by the commanders of each particular front. And they, so you could be in a territory and you know this side of the river had this particular regulations and this other side of the river had other regulations because they had different commanders. Uh, but in general, they would that one, one they would limit the amount of forest that each um, family could um, cut uh, by in each um, season, in each um, um, non-rainy season, and um, something that was very effective was uh, a ban on um, hunting of several species, um, tapers, for example, um, cafuches, you know, and, and, and other kinds of species. So. The guerrilla in general um, had uh, not only benefited from conservation, but enacted uh, measures that uh, benefited conservation. But the guerrilla also benefited conservation through other measures, uh, for example, that, that you know, are, are not particularly nice. One of the most important weapons of guerrilla warfare against uh, the military uh, in Colombia was landmines. And landmines were very important for um, not enabling, uh, you know, people to settle there or you know, economic interests to come into those areas. But you know, landmines are one of the most horrific uh, weapons used uh, in our in our irregular warfare. So, in general, we could say that guerrillas um, were important for conservation, and one of the um, proofs towards that is that after the peace agreement. Uh, deforestation has increased. And the reasons are many, but one of the reasons is that the kind of protection that certain forests received was um, disappeared after the, the guerrillas um, handed their arms. But certain areas like the Nigua National Park, that park that I was mentioning before when I was answering Pedro that I particularly love, was under a commander who was a wonderful economist and who um, spearheaded or who um, um, helped the establishment of a cattle ranching economy. And so, it, it, you know, in, in this part of the park, the FARC was limiting um, um, 
deforestation. And on the other part of the park, the gorilla was uh, fomenting deforestation because the cattle economy was important as a source of income and um, support and whatnot. So the story is not so, so straightforward. Thank you. Okay, and Roger, Roger, thank you, thank you for your your question. This is a this is a fascinating uh, debate, and uh, as you, Alex, Samira, uh, share with me that discipline related to environmental history of the Cerrado, and we are debating how uh, uh, the problem of uh, delineating maps of biogeography. Uh, had played a very intricate, intricate role in Brazilian environment because we have a history of a uh, of uh, big biogeographical formation since the Marcius map from the 19th century. So since that time, we have this kind of uh, recognition to divide our territory in this those great or this big uh, biogeographical formations. And what I no, in terms of the production of maps, is that uh, those geographers used uh, the maps that was produced by the Brazilian Council of Geography. And so since the 1940s, after Jorge Zaru uh, moving to the United States, and uh, the, at, the, uh, at the beginning of the Brazilian Institute of Geography, uh, they tried to approach uh, of the methodological, geographical methodology of American universities. And so they brought a lot of geographers and cartographers and those Americans, uh, geographers, helped uh, to, to, to describe or to construct those maps. I found, for example, in Robert Carmi, in his, his studies related to central Brazil and the, the city of Goiás, uh, the, the, the state of Goiás, how the city of Annapolis which was in the border of this forest that region, play an important role in the building of a hinterland. And that city was an open of the Western expansion. And it was in, it, it doesn't have the same dimension of uh, a Cronos book related to Chicago, but in the same way, Annapolis played an important role in connecting uh, a place where infrastructure uh, 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 was, was happening in the connection between that forest and land. In those maps, the, the, that map work was present. Also, in Leo Weibel's work, and Weibel's published other uh, articles in English in the United States in the 1940s, and he used this kind of map, and they had a pattern that was different for from what we now call as uh, biome maps. Uh, and they divided the vegetation, not, they divided the biogeographical division in Brazil, not in biomes, but in vegetation. For example, what uh, Warrington called as the Atlantic forest biome, they divided, uh, they called uh, tropical forest. So the Araucaria, for example, was was not taking part of that vegetation. In the same way, the forest region of central Brazil that nowadays belongs to the Cerrado biome was part of this kind of uh, forestation. In, in, this, in this way, I think the, the, the Preston James work is unbelievable, fundamental, because it precedes Warren Jeans and he includes a lot of areas that Warren Jeans work it doesn't uh, uh, include it. So, of course, with the limitations of research, but differently, he was in field strips, taking notes, taking photographs, and something that uh, Warren Jim, in a certain way, it doesn't make. I, I, you know, if you know what I mean. So, uh, I think those are uh, geographical uh, studies especially related to the deforestation of what we now are calling as Atlantic Coast Forest were, uh, was one important topic of those geographers in the 1940s and the 1950s. And Preston James is a key person for that subject. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Sandro. Um, 
we're going into extra time here. I'm gonna make there for maybe a final round. There are three people with questions. Um, I'm gonna read Samuel's and Adi can uh, have her comments and then last uh, Andy Acosta can. Uh, Alex, I noticed that Reynaldo will also raise his hand. So I am not yeah. sure. If... Oh, I didn't, I'm sorry, I didn't notice. So, and then Reynaldo was at the off. beginning. It is at the beginning. So I think here you lost. His... Oh, don't, don't worry, uh, hey, because the time, next time I, I will write you directly. No, don't worry. It was about Bible because connect in some way uh, some of your presentation and wonderful presentation. Congratulations. Next time. So Samuel uh, is asking Marina for maybe an example of what you said as toponymy can help us understand past environments. Uh, Adi, you can uh, make your comments now if you wish, and then Andy Acosta after you. Okay, so, so I, I say my comment right now. Okay. So thank you for the great presentations. And I have one comment and one question. And the first comment is about uh, something that the pictures at Sandro's presentation made me think about, uh, about these pictures of the geographers doing field work. And that reminded me some talk that uh, Joyerio, Sandro and I had some, a few months ago about how uh, these experiences in fieldwork are so important and actually Sandra was, was proposing a, a term called autobiographical landscapes because uh, these kind of experiences with mosquitoes, with heat, with cold, um, that really is a, a very nice raw material and, uh, for research. And it really triggers a lot of ideas to, to make research. And I think we all share that kind of love and awe for, for nature, right? And well, that was only a comment. And the question is um, for Claudia and Sandro, because I see the, uh, a similarity in their, in their works about um, how the frontiers advance in forested, forested areas. So, um, and how these, these frontiers, these, these advance, uh, make the borders blurred, right? They, they are not very well defined. And I wonder if you uh, have explored the frontier, not from the side of the pioneers, but from the side of the forest itself. The, the forest uh, mm, uh, have, have changes in in the vegetation, uh, but also in the in the fauna, in the animals, in soil, in water courses. So, okay, that's that's my question. Thank you. Gracias, Adi. Um, Andy can ask. Well, uh, I will ask directly to Professor Marina, but uh, well, thanks so much. But it's very brief. Um, Ashley, if you notice using GIS, uh, you talk specific about um, historical geography, but what about environmental changes, big environmental changes in the landscape um, that you notice using historical maps? Because I see in your project that you there, for example, Espejos de Agua that appears in some maps, bigger, but in others it's short uh, or small. Is that has to do with seasons or has, that has to do with human impact or natural? Uh, uh, processes. Thank you. Is that clear? Thank you. Thank you, Andy. And Samuel, if, uh, if you wish to put your, your question out or you can wait, uh, finish uh, uh, elaborating it, it's up to you. I, I just wanted to hear a, like a specific example from Marina's work about a toponym that would be interesting for all of us to learn about. That, that's all. I have to. You said you said that you have another question that unites the three speaks, but yeah, can... I'll, I'll 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 say it now. You no need to to answer this if we we want to end the call. But I was struck by the Preston James map of changes in forest cover and clearing over time, 
and how in 1700, it's only the Northeast that has forest cleared. And, and this is also, it goes back to what, Sandra, you were saying about the limitations of Dean's book, that he's mostly in the, the Southeastern part. I'm just wondering, was there a geography to the knowledge and technology transfer of forest clearing from the Northeast to the, the Southeast and, and into Goyas? Um, yeah, that's, but is there a geography to the transfer of knowledge of forest clearing? That's my question. And we can talk about that later. We don't have time now. Okay, great. I think there are a lot of questions for all three of you. Um, there's no order. Whoever wishes to start, you might guest. Well, may I? Sí. Yes. Para Sam. Tengo algunos ejemplos. Mira. Un caso es Tagua. Tagua significa jabalí. Jabalí en el año 1760. Hoy no está. En los mapas actuales no está. O por ejemplo, eh, hay otro. Ah, este es excelente. Arapey. Arapey significa agua que baña los dominios del cacique Arapé o también río de aquellos árboles. Habría que verificar que esos árboles sigan estando. Por lo general, en algunos topónimos donde habla de la presencia de árboles, de flores o de animales, En esos mapas o en esos libros de 1600 o 1700, cuando voy al siglo XX o XXI, ya no están. Y es eh, en relación a la pregunta de Andy, cuando trabajamos con mapas eh, de 1700, Algunos de ellos no tienen buena definición, ni tienen eh, un buen método de trabajo. Técnicamente no son eh, accuracy. Entonces, eh, hay deformaciones en cuanto a la ubicación de los elementos geográficos. Eso lleva mucho tiempo adicional de edición. Bueno, continúo entonces. ¿Terminaste, Marina? Yes. <laughs> so, so responding to Adi, and I'm going to be brief because we're we're way over time. Um, it's hard to see frontier expansion from the perspective of the forest, and you know what's the forest? Let's say from the perspective of the animals, which might be a little bit easier. I would just say that um, I I spend one month a long time ago in a research station just wandering around the forest and watching animals and vegetation and that was key for me to, to kind of imagine what it can be when frontier expansion comes to the place and when the forest you know disappears and how it impacts the, the those lives that I was able to have a little glimpse at uh, throughout that um, throughout that month. So when I write about these issues and I try to describe the changes that settlers make on the landscape, you know, there's a little hint of what it could be, how it could be seen from the other side. But the truth is it's it's really from the side of the settlers and not so much from the side of, of the animals. It's 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 a challenge. I'll I'll keep it in mind. So, uh, Adi, thank you. Thank you so much for your, your uh, question. Uh, because it's, a, it's a very interesting in, in terms of uh, trying to understand the perspective of those geographers in terms of knowing forests. And I have, uh, in thinking about replying to you, I was wondering that there is no, there is any photograph of a untouched forest that region, all the photographs was taken in process of deforestation. 
in uh, for in uh, in uh, for example, Leo Weibel, I was trying to find some uh, natural vegetation of the forest, but all of his photographs, all the photographs uh, that was taken into uh, his field trips were photographs related to agrarian transformation. So he, is, he wasn't the father of the German ag uh, agrarian geography. So uh, he was so interested, so impressed by that kind of landscape transformed. And so the trees are mentioned at the airports, but uh, any photograph of a place or of, of a, a natural beauty of the forest that it would be remarkable if I, if I found it. But thinking about your question, I, I have been wondering because uh, thinking related to the frontier expansion and the, the role that of figures or characters had played in this, in this history, I've been wondering, the hidden history of the, of the trees and of the forests, the hidden uh, or silence stories of the woodcutters, of the mateiros, that uh, accompany the geographers at their few trips. And they were the pioneers, or they go with the pioneers for deforestation. And the mateiros also, they knew where, uh, where, uh, where were the best places for coffee plantation, which they call the Mata of the first class woodland, second class woodland, they could recognize the landscape, but the geographers didn't take care to talk about the role in this process of conquering of a uh, of forested frontier. Preston James mentioned, and they, he talks about it, makes some, just a few notes, related to the role of the materials, but it's something very, very short. So the most important topic uh, for that forest, that expansion agriculture frontier in the, in, in the woodlands were the pioneer settlements. So that uh, uh, maybe I try to find some documents, but it's, it's, it's very interesting. And, uh, Another thing I'd like, I, I, I really enjoyed that you mentioned our debate related to the autobiographic landscape, because this is something that is related to our own uh, research, because I was, that place for me, like the National Agriculture Colony, the place where, where I was raised. And nowadays it's a, it's a, it's a farming land, but it, in, few, uh, in the middle of the 20th century was a forest that, in a beautiful forest that landscape that was completely transformed. So it's a fascinating, and this is something that uh, was important to me to, to, to write or to talk about this, this, this history because it's, it's a kind of my autobiographic landscapes as we, uh, as you, Roger and I have debated recently. So thank you, Roger. And, and about Sam, Sam, I think that uh, the most important kind of transfer was not technology, but methodology. And I found this in, in terms of uh, the, for example, I, there, there was a letter uh, where Robert Platt wrote to uh, uh, the president of IBJ, I forgot his name right now, Cristóvão something. And he said, uh, he was researching at the Baixada Fluminense. And he said, one thing that the Brazilian geographers have to know is how to work in the field trips, is to developing their methodology in field trip. And this is what IBGE or, or National Council of Geography need to improve. So there was a, the presence of a American university here uh, in, in Brazil, especially uh, in this project in connection, in, in collaboration with BGE, is trying to improve geographical methodologies, especially in field trips. But in terms of technology, I am not sure, I, but it's something that uh, probably we have to, to search for. So thank you, thank you, Sam. Okay, um, I think, 
I can say that's a wrap maybe for our three sessions. We are 20 minutes overdue. Um, I'd like to thank everyone for, for being here. Thank the three presenters for their wonderful talks. Uh, everybody that came here and was able to watch their talks and to participate and ask questions and you know interact. This is the best we can do in terms of interact at interaction. So thank you all for coming here and have a wonderful reminder of your day. Gracias a todos. Ciao, un abrazo, gente. Gracias a todos. Viva Solcha. Grande, Sandro. Saludos. Cuídense mucho. Chao. Chao, cuídense. Chao, chao. Un abrazo, muchas gracias. Marina y Sandro, mil gracias. A ustedes. Gracias a todos. A ustedes, Claudia, gracias. Alex, gracias. Thank you for. Hola, Alex. Claudia, querida, abrazo, Marina, querida, abrazo. Así. Ah, sí, sí ver, muchas así. gracias. Sí, muchas Ay, gracias. sale el corazón. <risa> <risa> chao, cuídense. Chao, chao. Chao. chao.